Have you ever questioned the efficiency, cost, and real-world value of a four-year college education? Have people told you that college is necessary, but you know it's an outdated system? Want to learn what skills you need to focus on and how to gain them in one year as opposed to four? Today's guest, Nat Green, CEO and founder of Future Forge, an organization that's an alternative to college that equips students with the skills, mindset, and practical experience they need to thrive in today's economic job market. We'll discuss the shortcomings of traditional higher education, the importance of skills over knowledge, and what a new generation of learners need to focus on. Whether you're disillusioned with the bureaucracy and inefficiency of colleges or simply seeking a more effective route to career success, you'll gain a deeper perspective. I'm your host, Janaid Iqbal. I'm a certified career coach and professional resume writer. I've written over 600 resumes for people in high school to the C-suite across all industries. With over 290 recommendations at the bottom of my LinkedIn profile, I'm also the founder of NoDegree.com and on a mission to show that a college degree isn't necessary for success. I interview people who will share strategies to break into the top careers without the crushing debt. Let's get started. Growing in and knowing, wisdom is flowing. If you didn't know, now you know where I'm going. Welcome to another episode of the No Degree Podcast. I want to personally thank you for tuning in and supporting our show. If you haven't yet, hit that follow or subscribe button. I encourage you, don't keep this to yourself. Share these inspiring stories with your friends. Invite them to subscribe and connect with us on social media. So today, I have Nat Green, the CEO and founder of Future Forge, a company that exists to fill the gap that college does not fill after someone graduates. And for a lot of people, it also helps them replace college. So do you mind sharing a little bit more about it? Sure. So Futures Forge has sprung out of a frustration that uh, I and my co-founder have have had with college and the tertiary education system in general, uh, in that it's just, it doesn't really seem to be serving anyone well. Yep. And the entire model seems that it could be so much better. When you look at any one aspect of it, it's like, oh, this could be better. That could be better. We can improve here. But when you try and improve it, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. And I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in a lot of different aspects of the educational system, and I'm just frustrated with it and needs to be better. Yeah. And that's what we're looking to do. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And you're so right, because I've done a lot of resumes for people who work in higher education, and they say the bureaucracy, the inefficiency, the politics within the systems really hurt the students because I have a friend who works at a, at a college and during a career fair, he was told by someone saying, hey, don't talk to the employers. Those are my contacts. And I don't want you, make, I don't want you making me look bad. But it's like, why would you not? It's not a competition. It's not like if he builds a relationship, you lose out. At the end of the day, the kids benefit. And so many people are focused on keeping their positions and they think of it as a competition and it's the kids who suffer. Now, why did you start this? Like, what gives you the motivation? Well, there, there were a couple of, a couple of reasons, right? But the underlying one is I just don't like the fact that it's not serving the customer, who in, in this case, well, the consumer really, but it, which is the kids. You know, the, the kids come, their families spend a lot of money or they take on a lot of debt and uh, spend like four years or most often much longer to get their four-year undergraduate degree if that's what they're doing. And they come out unprepared. If yeah. you look at the if you look at the surveys from employers, I mean I used to hire directly out of you know colleges for my last business, right? And people turn up, even the best and the brightest turn up without some of the basic skills you need to survive and thrive. And I don't know if it's always been that way, right? I wasn't I wasn't around 60 years ago. I, I can't compare it to that long ago. But what I do now is know is with what people need to survive and thrive now, they're not coming out prepared. And if you spend that amount of money and that amount of time, you should come up, you know, like holding onto a rocket. Yeah. I mean, you should just be shooting into the future. And that's not what's happening. You know what? What I will say is enrollment was a lot lower 60 years ago. And as you know, what happens is when you, before, if you went to college, it was like for a very specific purpose, very specific things. The workforce and the skills required were different. And then the people who grew up, grew up differently, right? Like nowadays, kids don't grow up with the same set of social skills. They don't grow up with the same set of home economic skills. You know, it was a different class of students. So I think that's one thing. And the one thing I will say is 
college is very interesting in the terms of the customer. Yes, the direct customer is the student, but the parents are the ones who are typically saving, right? Like when a kid's born, what are they doing? Save up for college. So that is one thing. So the customer in one aspect is the parent. The other aspect of the customer is actually the future version of yourself. And the thing is, this customer is normally in the 17 to 19 years old range. And this customer still has not developed. They still don't know what they want. And this customer lacks a lot of information. So it's a very interesting thing in that, yes, it doesn't serve the customer, but the customer doesn't even truly know what they want. They don't even know how to evaluate it. And a lot of times they are evaluating the brand, right? Like people go to college, oh, it looks nice. It does this, it does that. But they don't truly know how to judge it. Like, am I going to get a job? What does this major do? Who am I learning? And then also, if you think about the model, all the classes are the same prices. Now, I understand why that happens, but think about it. You're paying sometimes 6 k for an Econ 101 class, which you don't really need a professor to really learn versus like an econometrics where maybe you need a lot more guidance for that. And even if the professor is a TA, same price. Professor could be world renowned, the same price. One other big issue is professors aren't paid to teach. They're paid to do research. So you could be the worst professor, but if you're, you do great research and you bring in a lot of grants, you'll be okay. So it's one of those things that a lot of students don't think of it that way. And they're not educated consumers. Look, you touched on about 42 different points there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. So why it's so problematic, right? I mean, I mean, a couple of them. Who's teaching you? So you, you talk about the concept of the, uh, you know, macro econ 101 yep. or something, right? And you're paying six grand for it. What should that course, what should the technical content of that course cost you? Yep. It should be zero dollars. Why? Because you can access it for free online already. Yep. So the value is zero of yep. that knowledge in that course. And you go, okay, but if the teacher's teaching you, yeah, I, I guess in your class of 350 people. Yep. In the lecture hall, I bet that that personal connection is super valuable to you. I'm not so sure myself. And so you also talked about people like not knowing what they want to do. And so why would you have a system where we send people off, often going away from home for the first time, and they have no idea what they're going to do, and we're spending a fortune on it? Like, yeah. if, you were to, if you were to take a clean sheet approach and design a new and better system, which is what we're looking to do, yeah. it would be radically different. And one of the fundamental things, like, why did I get into this? Well, well, if you look at the way universities have been built and, and, and have grown up in the system, it started a long, long, long time ago when one or two percent of the people went on to college. Yep. Okay. So it was built for an extreme elite, either some very interesting bookish people, right? Or wealthy people who needed yep. to finish, finish off before they, you know, went and joined yep. the family business or something, right? And, and so you've got this situation where universities had a monopoly on knowledge. Yep. Okay. You had books were expensive. Specialist publications were hard to come by. So you had to travel. You had to, you know, put your bag yeah. on your back and you had to go on by train or something off to some college town, you know, 50 miles away, 100 miles away. And there, there was a collection of people who actually wanted to learn your stuff. Yeah. Well, there weren't many people looking to study this stuff, right? And so you had to gather them together. And then in terms of people with the expertise to explain it, again, you had to bring them in. So it made sense that we go away somewhere, we're all studying community for a bit, and then we go off and come back. But if you fast forward now, I mean, knowledge is completely ubiquitous. It's free. There's too much knowledge. You know, if I pick up my smartphone, yeah. I can learn anything, like short of how to make a nuclear weapon. I bet there's stuff on there too. I just yeah. wouldn't search for it because I don't want to be on the NSA's yeah. uh, you know, database. So. But, but the thing is, is you can learn anything you want. And so the whole model is fundamentally wrong yep. that, that, that we go to where the knowledge is. Now, I believe learning in community is very, very important with yep. people. Like, and anybody who doubted that, COVID, I think, has finished yeah. that off that we're all going to learn remotely. But yeah, the system is just from the ground up is built incorrectly to serve undergraduate students, which is what I'm focused on. And, you know, it made sense at a certain time, whereas like it was very hard to find that knowledge, right? You ha either had to, it was in books, in you had to go to that expert person, you didn't have access to so much things. And now it's like, what I think if you're ever going to any of these things, it's the community, it's the the network and all that. But now the other thing is, is that you can get that community and network for much cheaper, you can get it online. And funny thing is, I've developed a stronger community on LinkedIn, and through my podcast, and that community is much stronger than what I got at college, right? And I went to like an Ivy League, which is, hey, you pay for the network. And oftentimes, a lot of times is you have to learn how to build a network. And once you learn how to build a network, 
that's something that a college doesn't really teach you. One other big issue is that I see a lot of parents are like, hey, I want my kids to have the college experience. And it's like, okay, like you can, you can just have someone take one class, live on campus, and they'll have a way better college experience that's way cheaper than someone who's, you know, paying, you know, full tuition and all that. Yeah, I mean, look, there's no question. Uh, there are a lot of people who have this idea of the college experience and how valuable it is. But I think they don't know what's going on on campus these days. Yep. Uh, they, they mustn't be very well informed because if you look at the stats, half of the kids are depressed. Yep. And and that that wasn't the case in my day. Yeah. You know, this is, I mean, I you know, it's been 30 years uh, almost since I was uh, an undergrad. Yeah. And uh, people seem to have a pretty good time. Now, there's some people who weren't having a good time, but they are yeah. by far the minority. Yeah. And now it, it's sort of heading towards the majority of people who are there on campus with you aren't, aren't having a good time. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I'm not saying it's college's fault, right? Some yeah, yeah. of this is just societal trends. So that's one thing that's changed. The other thing is, if you're paying full rate, okay, tuition, room and board, all the extra expenses at a private college in New England, and you manage to graduate in four years. Now, remember, the average person takes five years to graduate yep. from their undergraduate degree. But let's say you do it in four. You're spending way in excess of $300,000. And to me, that is, you know, that's just too much to be having some fun. Yeah. I'd much rather see someone spend a year, take a gap year, yep. take some classes, decide they don't like, you know, math and that they want to study something else, you know, whatever it is that they're yeah. going to do, right? And they can pivot, go live with some different people, and learn about them, you know, yep. make friendships, do all that, and then go choose a degree, at least because the yep. average person loses six months of their college career switching majors because they decide what they went into uh, study isn't what they like. Yeah. And I go, that's great, go find yourself a college. Yeah, but at, at hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. of cost, it's, it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And I always tell people, like, we push a lot of kids to go to college at 18 years old. That's not the best age for everyone. For some kids, they know, hey, I, I want to be a lawyer. I want to do X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. Go ahead. Good. But a lot of people don't learn until they actually get a job. They actually work somewhere. They try a couple of different things. Um, like the things I do, like it was not a viable career. And there were things I did not even know about. Right? Yeah. And at that time, and things changed. Like I, I was an actuary. And for a couple of years, it was always like the top job. It was always in the top five jobs in terms of stress. But what happens is a lot of these journalists and people who write these articles, they don't actually live the careers. They don't actually have in-depth knowledge about that. They'll just get a quote for an article. They'll look at some data on the surface and they'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah. But it's like, if I were to go back, any kid who tells me that they want to be an actuary, I actually convince them not to do it. And I tell them why, because actuaries are underpaid data scientists. I tell them, hey, as a data scientist, you have much more flexibility in the companies you can work for. It has a brighter future you have so much more and you can still get the same intellectual challenges that you would get, but you're not stuck and you're not pigeonholed. And you can spend, instead of hundreds of hours on exams, you can spend hundreds of hours working on projects. So that's something that a lot of people uh, don't realize. So which areas would you say colleges are really failing kids? And before I go into that, are you frustrated with your job search? Are you sending out resume after resume with no callbacks? If so, I have some good news. After three years of helping over 400 people land jobs at places like Meta, HubSpot, Google, Twitter, Amazon, Tesla, Disney, Sony, I created a course. In the Get Your Dream Career course, you'll discover best practices for creating a resume that stands out, and you'll also learn how to optimize your job search. It covers every aspect of the job, including resumes, application strategy, networking, LinkedIn profile optimization, interview guidance, and salary negotiation. You will also get a behind the scenes view of how recruiters use LinkedIn to find candidates. And of course, you'll get resume and cover letter templates. Get one step closer to your dream job. Sign up at the link in the notes below. One more thing that I totally forgot. Okay. The 300,000, right? And most people are not, you know, there's some scholarships, so they, they're paying a range, right? I think the average student loan debt is in the 40Ks. So that means some people are paying little, some people are paying 80, 150, 200, right? There's still a lot. One thing I always tell people, you can bribe someone for a job for $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> way cheaper and then you could do the rest. So just realize that. But you know, this is reality. A lot of people don't understand that they're going to these schools and they don't realize that networking doesn't start when you go to college. Networking starts when someone's five years old and they go on family vacations together and they're 
dad's friend is that. So a lot of people don't even realize that they're not truly going to get the network that they're going to at some of these schools because these kids have parents who've already built networks, who've already set them up, who've already have referrals. And you're, you may be the odd one out if you don't have that network. Yeah. And I, I think the other interesting thing is people don't, um, they don't typically get taught how to build and nurture a network yep. at college. I'm unaware of, I mean, I'm sure there'll be a college somewhere doing it, but I'm unaware, unaware of undergraduates in particular yep. being particularly uh, focused or skilled or having coaching or feedback or understanding about how to build and nurture a network. Obviously at business school, it's like people are fighting to get in and yeah, do yeah. that sort of thing, right? That's very different when you get to grad school, but, but yeah, as undergraduates, it's not happening. So this idea that you're going to build this powerful network, I, I think is very, very uh, overrated and I think it's mostly an excuse. Yep, you know, to your point, you can build one in other ways. Yeah. It's a justification. And it's understandable because it's not that colleges are a bad place. It's just they're not anywhere near as good as they should be. And, and they provide very, very poor value for money uh, that you could deploy in a better way. Yeah, like, for example, when I was at Columbia, I was forming a Toastmasters club and I had to get, you know, for those of you who don't know, Toastmasters is an international public speaking organization. It's a great way to network. It's a great way to build your public speaking skills. So I was the president of that and I was trying to get members. So I went to the dean of the business school and I had a meeting and I was like, hey, you know, we're looking to expand the club. Can we sort of collaborate to get some of your students? You know what his response was? He said, oh, our MBAs, they already know how to present. They already know how to do all that. They don't need it. Go to the international students section. Here's the thing for any of you who have worked corporate, these MBAs or just in general corporate presentations, they're boring. They're very dry. They're these PowerPoints. They're not exciting. So it's not that the even at the top schools, these people are not the best presenters. You know, they're not keynote presenters. They just do little workshops and they think they're good, but they're not. Most people are itching for their next coffee when the meeting ends. They're like falling asleep and all that. So even a lot of times they believe that, hey, we have the solution. We get the best student. But all those people were successful before they ever got in. So if you filter and if I make a filtering system and I only allow make it hard, people will succeed even if I have the worst program. So what I want to ask you going back, where would you say they're failing kids? So we're talking about that they are failing. Now let's get into detail. How would you say? So they don't know how to build a network. What else? Well, well, even I start at macro level. So 60% yeah. of kids that start in college don't graduate with a degree. Oh, wow. So 40% straight away of people who, you know, happily go off to college. Yeah. Um, they're essentially wasting their time and money because the way it works without micro credentialing and stuff, where we have this binary outcome of did you get your degree or not? Yeah. Then 40% of the people are failed straight away. Yep. Because they're, they're worse off than someone who just has a GED. Yep. Because they went to college, spent time and money and got nothing. Yep. So they're like actually behind on someone who just went and got a job straight yeah, out of yeah. high school. So, so they fail straight away there. Then, the college degree is all built around knowledge in a specific area. And yeah, they do some general classes at such yeah. a shallow level that you should just do those on Coursera anyway, yeah. right? But it's built around knowledge in a domain. And the high, entire institution is designed that way, which is why it's so siloed and so hard yep. to reform. Because they talk about skills like, you know, critical thinking. But you don't go to study critical thinking. You go to study mathematics, yeah. right? Or you go to study English or whatever. And they'll say, well, but you know, we teach you about critical thinking while you're there. Well, I doubt it because then you'd be organized differently. Yeah. Right. I, you can't have all these silos. In theory, they're spending a small percent of the time to teach these, these skills that businesses always rate in the top five. Yeah. Like ability to think critically, right? And make decisions based on that. So if you want a job and you want to thrive in your career, you need to learn something like that. But that, so they're organizing correctly. And what happens with this knowledge is almost nobody goes and uses the knowledge afterwards. Yeah. So I'll take, I mean, the average is like, it's something like, so 60% uh, manage to graduate, 40% drop out. Yeah. Uh, right. Of that remaining, half enter a job that doesn't use their degree at all. Right, so all this knowledge, all these classes, all that matters is the skills you pick up, yet you're tested mostly on your knowledge. Okay, so they're organizing correctly, which fails the kids. And then even when you take a real uh, specific degree, like I studied engineering, there's no way even 20% of my engineering class went and became an engineer. So even on the most vocational, very focused subject, intense, it is critically important that engineers learn about engineering. Otherwise, bridges fall down, right? Like, it's really, really important. Yeah, you can't learn how to make a bridge on YouTube. Yeah, but but most but most people actually you can. Oh, but, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but most people don't even use their their knowledge if they're in it. And and then you go, well, why did they even waste 
the the slot like like take i don't know some top college you know studying you yeah. know you're studying civil engineering in the u.s what percent of those students go on and study civil I, I'm, I'm sorry actually go yeah. and do civil engineering or become an architect or some you know something yeah, in, yeah. in the industry again probably less than half don't you think they could run a one-year course instead yep that help people understand and pre-qualified them and they understand they can go straight in and then quite go do a one year intensive practical degree. Yeah. Right. You know, that just, just that everything else you should just learn in other communities and other settings is going to be more effective. Yeah. Um, the one thing though, that's really popular at the moment, which I won't get too much into obviously is, is, is the problem that universities have been politically captured. Yeah. So whenever an institution doesn't matter what it is, whenever it becomes politically captured, you know, and it's now largely partisan. Yeah. It's just going to be at war for the rest of time or yep. irrelevant because it doesn't have broad support. And the stat that's obviously been coming out because of the recent, you know, troubles yes. uh, at Harvard, which the troubles at Harvard have been around for a long, 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 long time because yeah, yeah. people are paying attention to just one small aspect of it. But if, if less than 2% of your staff, right, your teaching staff identify as conservative, and I'm not saying whether conservatives are bad yeah, or yeah. good or anything like that, but if like 30% of the country identify as conservatives, I don't know what the stats are, but yeah, yeah, yeah. slightly wrong, right? But Jeff, then how can you possibly be getting a liberal education there? Yeah, yeah. It's not actually possible. So you go, oh, you know, liberal education is wonderful. Go off to university and hear these divergent thoughts. Yeah, I don't think that's happening at Harvard. It can't possibly be. And yeah. if it's not happening there, where is it happening? And that's what you should find out. Like, if you want to learn to think differently and, 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 you know, and to have a diversity of thought, I think the most important part of diversity, the, the bit I value the most is diversity of the mind. Yep. Okay, that's the piece that I'm interested in. And you're not going to find it on a modern elite U.S. college campus. Yeah. I even read the other day, it might have been in the Wall Street Journal, so probably everybody knows this, that when conservative professors at Harvard meet, they meet in secret. Wow. Yeah, because it's too uncomfortable and danger dangerous. I don't mean to their physical um, physical safety, although maybe these days, but too dangerous for the meeting public. So the thing is, is how are they failing students? It's not safe to debate ideas. Yeah, it's not safe to understand you, you know different perspectives because there's an orthodoxy of thought now that must be adopted, and 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 that's the problem. And I just think you can do better elsewhere for a fraction of the cost. No, no, very true, very true. So now the don't have diversity in thought, what else would you say that they're really filling students on? Oh, the, it takes so long to get your degree. Like, even if you just took, worked it like a job. Yeah. You know, students graduate, they go to a job. You're going to work 45, 48, 50 weeks yeah, that yeah. next year. But at college, we barely ask them. I mean, because number one, you're not working hard all week half yeah, the time. Yeah. Right. It's not exactly a full workload. And then, you know, during the summer and all these breaks that they have that are largely structured so that professors can do research, mm. you, you know, and, and they're structured around things like the agricultural calendar from the 18th century. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the reasons why these schedules exist are, are kind of crazy. So kids spend four years instead of two. If you just took the actual classes they attend and you butted them up and asked people to work, right, which, which by the way, grit and determination and stuff are one of the largest predictors of success in your career. Yeah. So why don't we teach a bit of it at college by having people work back to back for two years? Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. If we did that. The other thing is, I heard this story the other day. So obviously with, you know, all the AI resources that are available now to do your homework for you. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you wonder why anyone does their homework. Well, you wonder why we have them do that lesson at all. Yeah. Like, like why do that assignment? Why didn't they construct an assignment that adds value while you use the AI? So someone said, oh, you know, at my old college, they've brought back, one of the professors has brought back sitting down in the exam hall and writing your essay out. Okay, so you write it out with your pen and paper because people are using AI. And I sort of go, well, why don't we cancel the entire class and just have the kids use AI and learn how to do the jobs of the future, right? So, so it's like just how are they failing them? It's like any university that says you cannot use chatbot GPT to do your work, like I just think they should be removed from your list. Like they need to reform. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like teaching people, instead of teaching people how to change the engine in a car, it's teaching them how to put shoes on a horse. Yeah. I mean, that's a hundred years ago, dude. Like if I'm going to get somewhere, I'm jumping in a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and so the mindset's so outdated, they, they just can't help themselves. It's also a control agenda. They want to keep doing the things the way they did, but they want to control how it's going instead of embracing change. Right? And no entrepreneur would take that approach. Every entrepreneur I know is using AI in their business yep. somehow. Yep. So. You, it's more about giving assignments where the AI is not going to necessarily like it, it can assist you in the process, but you still need, you know, to do the final thing. And 
I, I think that's very important because I think a lot of people, they'll think that, hey, AI is going to replace jobs. It'll change things. And I think AI replaces tasks. And I say that you should focus on things that are not as much tasks, right? Because if you all you do is tasks that are very repetitive, they're going to find a way to automate that. But if you do things that have the human touch and you build skills like you'll be okay. Look, here's another one. Look, one more for you. Let's go. This, yeah, go this one of my favorites. Okay. Why would you go and spend four years in New Haven, Connecticut to learn Spanish? Yeah. Just, I mean, you know, some aliens get to come down one day and analyze us and they'll be like, yeah, we'd have thought like that they'd go to Spain. Yeah, yeah. Or Mexico or any one of, you know, yep. a couple of dozen countries if you want to learn Spanish. And you go, that's not what a Spanish degree is now. You know, it's also about the literature and whatever. I go, great. I bet they have books there too. Yeah. Right? You know, I bet you could do both. So it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that, you know, they're failing on the networking, the grit and determination. What else would you say they're failing kids on? This, uh... The, the, the fundamental problem is, if unless you want to become an academic, in which case, going off to college and spending as much time as you want is, is wonderful, right? Uh, yeah. You can have a great time, you'll fit right in. But if you don't want to be, then, then in most cases, the university environment is the worst place at all to learn about the real world yep. and to learn how to add value and to learn how to serve a customer and how to deal with conflict and on and on and on. So just the environment in general isn't very conducive to learning, I feel. It's conducive to having fun. I mean, I had a great time as an undergraduate. I don't know that I learned as much yeah. as I should have. And I wasn't, a, I was a very good student before. I went to college, wasn't a very good student at college, if I'm honest, but I did meet my future wife. You know, that was a bonus. Yeah. Uh, I, I did a lot of sports, a lot of other crazy activities. I learned to bungee jump, you know, lots of things. So, so it's like this weird bubble where you can explore and have fun, but if you're paying full freight at the moment, in the U.S., it's just too expensive, way too expensive. Now, what are some other things that you're addressing? So you, you've you developed this one-year program. What, what are you addressing in that one year to make sure that when they leave, that they're ready for the workforce? Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about, about what we're doing. So we ran a one-week program at MIT this uh, uh, in January called an IAP, and my business partner went to MIT, so we went and ran that there, and then we're doing a two-week summer camp, and then in the September 2025, we, we launch our full one-year program. Yeah. And that one-year program, most people will choose it as a supplement to going to college because people are so indoctrinated that you have to go yeah, to college. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard for people to let go of that. So I think we'll have some early pioneers who are really bold, uh, aren't trapped by the system, are able to think for themselves and their parents support it. They'll come into us. They'll go straight into the workforce. They're going to be our leading, you know, our, uh, the people who are going to lead the way, right? Yeah. We'll then have some people who come in, then go on to college. They'll be better prepared. We'll probably have a few people who are at college and are fed up and will drop out. We've yeah. already had interest from people in that situation. But what we, our goal though, is to create a challenge to the top hundred colleges that people come and choose to do our program and get a job rather than go and spend four years with them. That's our goal. And so, well, that's a bold thing to do, right? Because colleges, I mean, American colleges are so powerful, you have no idea, okay? Yeah. Just their endowment money alone, alone, just the income every year off their endowment money would make them a top 100 country in the world on GDP. Wow. Just the income. Now, that doesn't include the value of their buildings and artwork and book collections and you name it, you know, patents, whatever that they've got, right? So... It's so overwhelmingly powerful, but we've chosen to go for that end of the market because if you want to drive change, I know it's not going to happen internally, yeah. right? There's no way these colleges are going yeah, to change. Yeah. And we could, we could do like a three hour episode on why the change won't come from within. So it has to come from without, uh, outside the system. So we're targeting that. And so what, what you have to do is, is you have to go, well, how can I do it more efficiently? And so our first phase of developing this was, Okay, four-year degree, where's the waste? What's wrong with it? And like I studied engineering, so we go, oh, look at these bits. This bit doesn't add any value. I already talked about why do we have such a long summer break? Why don't people work more intensely? And so on. So we started to look at it that way. And then we realized that's the wrong way to look at it. So we, we, we kept some of that spirit, but mostly we threw that out the window. And the way we came at it is we went and did the research, secondary research, right? We didn't do primary research, but we went and read the stuff that's out there on what does it take to succeed in your life and career, right? And the two main areas. One is what are the sort of personal traits, the attributes that you hold that you can develop that science says, you know, the social scientists researching this stuff say leads to better outcomes, meaning, and they measure it in one of two ways, either your job title, you're promoted up higher than your peers, or you earn more money, right? Those are the two ways to measure success from an yeah. academic standpoint. 
everything else is just too subjective. Uh, like, you know, internal happiness with the choices you made. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know how you do a control study on that, right? So we looked at that and we chose the six most important factors in that. And then we also looked at, you know, because I, I said I used to run a business that recruited a lot of people out of college. We also went and looked at the research on what businesses say what are the skills they need when they either hire someone in the first place or when they promote them? And we've chosen the six most important ones of those. And so we've decided to just look at how you drive education from a totally different way. And the funny thing is, it's all science-based. So we're actually basing on science. And what you need to do is you need to understand that knowledge is worthless now. You need some knowledge, but only as a medium. But any knowledge you need, you, you can find out anyway. Knowing how to do that is very important, you know. And so we structure everything around the way we, we operate and train people is around challenges. So we give you a challenge. Redesign this product that doesn't work very well. Mm. Um, build a bridge across the stream. Uh, you know, I don't know. We, we haven't done this one, but I'll make one up. Make an electronic dance music track. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the challenge is. We obviously have a big diversity of them. They get yeah. harder. And, and what we do is we take people through a journey of understanding how to win and succeed at that challenge, okay, which is much more simulating the real life environment. Everything's done in teams. Your teams are trained to give feedback to each other, to other teams, everyone presents, and then the teams vote on which team did the best. Like we don't have grades. I don't believe in grades. I believe in testing. I don't believe in grades, okay? okay? So I believe in feedback, but like, why would you wait for a midterm grade or some grade at the yeah. end of the year? It's a waste of time. Every day, every minute, People will be getting feedback on their performance, what they've learned, congratulations, encouragement, where they've done well, so that that learning loop can happen mm. very quickly. So that's sort of what we're doing. It's based on the science, uh, a better way of driving learning, and open access to everything. So you can do anything. Like, like, like year two, we might run some of the same challenges. I expect people to just copy what the people in year one did, because it'll all be available. We're not hiding anything. And that's great, but we'll see what feedback people get. You know, did they innovate? Did they take it further? Did some group take a different approach? You know, so, so it's this idea that all knowledge is available and it's the attitude and approach you take to it. You know, the grit you show, the critical thinking, the how you work with your team, how you empathize with people and, 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 you know, help them perform better, how you activate your team to do better. Th th those are all the things that we are focusing on. And, and so it's kind of like an orthogonal approach. Like if traditional universities built on departments, right? And it's departments that teach you specific knowledge, right? We talked about math and, and uh, you know, you could have geography and other, other things, right? Different departments. We're turning it sideways and we're going, these are the skills and attributes that you need and everything is geared towards teaching them. The knowledge, go find it. It's everywhere. We don't care about it. And anything you learn at college, you won't be using anyway three years from now. Like anybody who's in college right now, what they're learning will be out of date by the time they graduate. Yeah. Almost certainly. Yeah. Okay, so so we don't care about that at all, which is why we can do it so quickly, because nobody is actually, you know, we're only going to take one year. Uh, I'd, I'd bet a large sum of money that the people coming out of our course will outperform uh, the equivalent group of people doing a four-year no, course. No, they will, because the thing about feedback, what I see a lot of colleges and a lot of colleges, a lot of college students, they believe in perfectionism. And I'll see a lot of them when they approach business, they were like, oh, I can't do this product. There's a better one out there. There's this and that. And there are so many companies that start and think about it. They get acquired. And when a company gets acquired, that means that the Google, the Microsoft, whatever, Amazon thinks like, hey, they have the funds to potentially try to do it themselves. But they're saying that it's going to be very, very hard to replicate what this person did, what this group did in a reasonable amount of time. And if you see that smaller companies are, are dominating in certain areas that they're not necessarily good at. Uh, so that's one thing. And then I've also seen group work in college is like pure BS because there's always one or two people who actually care about their grades and the rest piggyback off them. Like they barely do any work and the professor says, figure it out. And it's like, you cannot motivate someone who doesn't care about their grades and you're at the mercy of them. And I think it's a terrible way to kind of do it. Whereas like, you know, in a different program, it'd be like, all right, you're kicked out. You get a zero. Like you switch group members, right? Like if you're working at a company, someone's not doing work, right? There, for the most part, there are consequences, um, you know, more than there are consequences in college. 
It's fascinating because you come back to grades a couple of times. And, and here's the shocking truth about grades, yep. right? Is if I know your general mental ability, right? Which is a very polite way, academic way, you know, as I'm sure you know, for IQ, basically. Yeah. So the most popular, most well documented and used method that roughly approximates that, right? Is the SAT score. Yeah. So if I know your SAT score, and if you were to then tell me, I, I have a certain ability to predict how well you'll do yeah, in your yeah. career. Okay. Now, of course, it takes lots of other factors. That's why we're working on them. But, yeah. but if I know that, then, you know, if you also tell me your GPA, it doesn't increase the ability to predict how well you'll do in your career at all, meaning it adds no additional information of value. And so think about that. We have these poor high school kids. Their parents are beating them and berating them yeah. and their teachers are and they're all stressed, right? And they've got some useless cast they don't care about or some teacher they don't like and they're totally unmotivated. And we have them spending hours and hours and hours trying to eke out their A so their GPA is perfect so they can go off to some top college, right? And we have them playing that game. And, and yet it adds no value. So four years of sweat and tears doesn't add any more additional information. Like, and I'm just like, well, let's just get rid of the GPA then. Who cares about it? Now, we do need to test because, you know, we need to make sure people have the aptitude to do certain things. You know, like, you know, a fitness test for someone who's going to become a Navy SEAL might be kind of helpful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying we don't need to make sure people get into the right area for them to contribute to society, but, but the GPA is crazy. And then, of course, they go off and like this bright kid maybe goes to Harvard and they're all worried about their GPA. But it's something like 70% of all grades. I probably exaggerated it, yeah. you know, but it's something like 60, 70% of all grades at Harvard or an A. Yeah. So then it doesn't matter anyway. So why bother with them at all? I mean, it's, this sort of seems to me, yeah, they it have, seems to be pointless. Uh, you know, grade inflation and all yep. that. And then again, I've seen two types of students. There, are, I've seen students who do really well and then they go outside and it's like they, they struggle, right? Because it's a lot of communication. It's a lot of back and forth. It's talking to a customer. And sometimes people who are very good at school, sometimes they're terrible at talking to customers because they assume. And I've seen people, you know, when I'm marketing, they're like, oh, you know, how, like, for example, I have a friend who's a recruiter and he has over 200K TikTok followers. But if you talk to someone like a college student, they'd be like, oh, well, why would someone follow that? But there are lots of people in different areas who are doing well and they're not exposed. So I've also seen like that type of thinking where it's like, hey, I've learned that, you know, they have an assumption of how, let's say, TikTok or whatever works. They assume that the biggest accounts, but they don't realize that there are a lot of micro communities and you only get that through real world experience. And it's that's something that a lot of people don't really understand. Yeah. And I think I think the. You know, the biggest problem in all of this, of course, parents, it always yep. is. You it's know, always the parents. It's always, always the parents. And so the problem here is, like, I, I have a bunch of friends who work in the tech industry and in some of the big companies, right? And one of them was telling me, like, we get all these kids in, you know, they're new recruits. And they're brilliant. You know, they're at MIT yeah. and wherever and all these, all these great schools. And they come to work and they're not very, very useful because they've got no idea what to do or why they're there. Yeah. All they know is their family culture or their parents were like, you got to do well, study, do this, you know, learn the violin, start yeah. a charity, all the things you need to do to get into yep. a top school. And then you get into top school and then you got to work, 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 work. And then you get the job at, you know, one of these big tech companies. And then they don't know what to do because they don't know why they were doing any of it in the first place. And, you know, if I had advice to parents, it's for goodness sake, try, try at least help spend equal time on helping your kid understand what they're passionate about yep. and, and helping them work around that as pushing them to be successful. Because, you know, the scary truth is there's almost no evidence that going to college or going to a specific college makes any difference to your outcome. And this is quite a bold thing to say, right? It's, you know what? It's not bold because I was reading that people who got into Harvard but chose not to go had similar outcomes. So it's the ability to get in. Because think about it. If I made an institution and I just made it really hard to get in, I could teach nothing. and the people in that institution would still do well because if you have filters, what are you doing? You're filtering out people and you're putting people in. So it's just the more filters you put, the harder it is to get in. You have a, a group and then a lot of those filters really focus on, you know, if you're wealthy, right? It makes it a lot easier to get in because how can you start a charity if you don't understand the legal structure? You don't understand that, right? So if your parents start a charity that you kind of do and you go out, Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. How can you even start a charity if you have to work retail, right? So these, all these other things, right? Like, hey, play the violin. Okay, it's much easier. 
if you have a tutor who guides you and works with you every day and you have this accountability, right? Yes, you can learn it on YouTube, but you have to be an exceptional person to kind of learn a skill like that on your free time when you're like that. So yeah, no, I, I will f- fully back that other than like some, you know, edge cases where it's like it kind of transformed your life and, you know, you had this big epiphany and all that. Yeah, but for the most people, it's, you know, if you develop abilities to get in and you you develop the discipline and you can do all these things and you develop the determination, you will, that's much more important than well, getting into the school. Yeah, I mean, look, there's so many interesting points. It's such a good time to be in this space, yeah. right? It's so much fun. But think about this. People say that diversity is really important. And I already talked about diversity of mind. But, yeah. but great, so diversity is very important. And then they go to Harvard which yeah. is probably the least diverse place in the planet. Yeah. Half the people are valedictorians. Yeah. They're all in the top whatever point percent of IQ, right? They're all, I mean, it's like, there's not much diversity there at all. Yeah. If you're talking about, as I said, diversity of mind and yep. so on. So look, the, the thing that I find most fascinating is that if you go back 40 years, everyone was adamant you had to go to college and the value proposition was quite reasonable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for a start, college costs a third in real time, a third, le- sorry, only costs one third of the current cost. Yeah. Like approximately that, like 40 years ago, right? So it was way cheaper on the cost side. Yeah. And on the benefit side, there weren't that many people with college degrees, right? Because that, you know, yeah. you know, if you're coming out of college at 22, well, the people in the workforce ahead of you, not many of them had college degrees. And there was some value to that because knowledge was scarce. It was yeah. hard to learn this stuff. So, you know, clear value proposition. And policy Politicians will say things like, I'll have the numbers wrong, but, oh, you know, someone with a college degree adds, uh, earns X thousands of dollars a year more. I'll tell you, they say a million dollars over the lifetime. Right. So if you think about it, let's say 40 year career, that's like $25,000 a year. Great. So as long as you learn how to get that raise, <laughs> you compete Early. with the college, your, counter, your college counterpart. No, but also the thing is, it was always nonsense because the people who went to college are typically selected out of the top half of yeah. academic ability and motivation. Right. Yeah. And the people who didn't go to college include the people who are like totally unmotivated. So it's just a pure selection bias in the first place. The whole argument is nonsense. Right. And so, but, and, and then if you look forward 20 years, th- we can't possibly have this current system exist. There's no way. It's just too crazy. So at some point, the system's going to break and fold. Yeah. And we know it worked well 40 years ago. We know in 20 years ago, it won't exist, this current system. And we're in the midst of that change. And there'll be early adopters who do different things. And, and what that means is if you're an, 18 year old right now, the parent of an 18 year old, and you're thinking about college or, you know, 17, you're gearing up. The thing I want people to understand is you can be really confident that it doesn't matter if you get into the 80th rank college instead of the 60th or the 2000th instead of the thousand. It really doesn't matter at all. What's much more important is if you go click around on one of the online, you know, providers and you go, you know, take a few little classes on some things you think you might be interested in and discover if you want to bother doing it. Because if you want to make money, you're much better off going and becoming an electrician. Yep. Much, 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 much better off. And if you want to run your own business at 28, go get your master's license, learn a bit. Learn, you know, learn how to uh, network, learn how to look after customers, yeah. learn how to run business, and then go start your own, um, you know, electrical business under your license. And yeah. I mean, you know, you'll be earning a million bucks a year by the age of 25, uh, sorry, 35, like no question if yeah. you run that well. And you it's hard to do anywhere else. You know, it's a trick. You have to make friends who go to colleges, technical friends, and then you're the electrician for them and you're the handyman. And that's a great way to make money. Great way. No, no, yeah. it is good. So this was a very informative and thoughtful episode. Is there any final thoughts, anything you want to share, any way that someone can support you? Yeah, uh, supporting, there's there's a number of ways. So uh, we want to hire, the, you know, well, recruit the best and the brightest into our program. So we're in the midst of gearing that up right now. We've already raised a um, million dollars of pledges into our scholarship fund. So if people want to, I mean, some very generous donors who, who really see the vision that people need a choice. This idea that if you don't go to a traditional college, you're somehow lesser than other people or have lesser prospects, you know, is is nonsense. It's a nonsense. And they believe that. And that's one of the main reasons why they're supporting us. And that that that's being applied to our summer camp. And then obviously our program is starting. So we've got a long way to go on that. And the other thing is, if you're uh, a bright, motivated person and you want to learn the things that we're teaching, go to our website, uh, which is futuresforge.org, and you can learn all about what we're doing. There'll be updates on things and, and ways that people can start to learn some of the things that we think are important without coming to us. Okay. And then, and then see if you can apply and get into one of our courses because we're, we're starting at quite a high end, right? So there's, there's, um, uh, criteria and potential. We're, we're recruiting some pretty, 
pretty capable people, especially in the beginning, because our model is disrupt the space that way, prove value, and then expand to the whole market. Uh, you know, and so we'll be expanding as we go forward. But yeah, come and see what we're doing. See if someone would benefit by joining us. Uh, and you know, consider donating to the scholarship fund. It's already serving people. I love that. So I'm looking forward to the changes you're going to make because this is a much better opportunity than going to a traditional college. And for people who have gone, they can cover all the gaps. So thank you so much for your time, Nat. This is yep. a great episode, and I look forward to having future discussions with you. It was my pleasure. Growing in and knowing, wisdom is flowing. If you didn't know, now you know where I'm going.